welcome back to Ashton Gate. It feels so good saying that with fans here. Another opportunity, and it's onside, and it's two for Bristol City at this time, and it's in. An early goal for Bristol City, and Andy Vyman is back. And it goes there, ahead of Bristol City, and they are level. It's a first goal for Andy King for his boyhood club. Well, good afternoon. Welcome once again to Robins TV. Spirit, togetherness and quality, all words now associated with this youthful attacking Bristol City side. And as we seek a win today that could be the catalyst for the rest of the season, we head to Bloomfield Road, a venue not visited by Bristol City for 10 years. You have to go back even further than that for our last win up at Bloomfield Road as well. But hopefully today is the day Bristol City get back to winning ways. Sat alongside me, as ever, is our account. Academy Director Brian Tinian. Uh, Brian, first of all, reflecting on last weekend, dis a disappointment in the end and a difficult one to stomach given how impressive the performance was. Yeah, so many positives last week and I think that's been taken onto the training ground this week, a really bubbly, uh, bright week of training and I thought the performance last week was one of the, the best we've had for a long time. I think very front-footed, um, attacking, energy and uh, really impressive last week and if we can take that on now, as you say, for the rest of the season. I think we're going to have a, a really bright finish to the season with a lot of, to look forward to for next. And we spoke just ahead of, um, ahead of going live just a few moments ago. You know, if this squad was fully fit, you've got these young players now that arguably would keep the likes of Matty James and Andy King out the side, particularly that midfield duo of Alex Scott and Masengo. Yeah, they've been given the opportunity and then they've, um, they've taken it now and they're looking now established players. I think that central midfield has got loads of energy and loads of drive and I think uh, with Antoine's resurgence as, as the striker and campering at the back, there's a lot of energy there and there's a lot of um, desire and running and the team looks a, a really good, exciting team at the minute. And the squad very much still together following uh, deadline day. And the big news from this week is obviously Eamon Benarus, uh, his contract uh, extension to 2025. And you obviously had a big part to, to play in that. Yeah. And it's brilliant to, to pin down these players for the foreseeable. Yeah, we're really pleased. We've been working on the Eamon one for a while with, uh, with Richard. And we're really pleased that is now done. We got Alex Scott done uh, not while, a while ago. And now if we can keep these young lads together, I think the future is so, so bright here. Campering, there's another one who signed a new contract not long ago. So, yeah, if we can get these tied down and build a really, really good, exciting squad around these good young players, then I think the, the future is really, really bright. And is there an extra importance around sort of keeping that nucleus of young players together? And the fact they come up through the academy, that's got to mean something extra when they actually become first team players. Yeah, they're really close. They're really close knit lot. We've got like nine in the in the squad today, uh, four starting and five subs, and they're really bonded together. And they want to help each other and they want to drive. And I think uh, I was speaking to Dave Rennie last week, and he said the younger ones, your Sam Bells and your Tommy. Conways and then when they train with us, we're the first team, they drive them on and they keep the, the other players driven. So it's, it's brilliant for everyone and there's a real buzz at the training ground. And to be fair, Nigel Pearson has given the opportunity. So there's got to be a lot of credit goes to Nigel. He's given Pringy, he's given Scotty, you know, and he's now playing Antoine as a striker. So there's three big pluses. So we're really pleased. Absolutely. Well, Pring, arguably, if it wasn't for Andy Vyman's form, arguably the player of the season so far. Let's, uh, let's have a look at the teams that will go toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe today then, uh, starting with Neil Critchley's side for this afternoon. Uh, two changes for the hosts. It looks like a change of formation too from the Fulham game, from a 5-4-1, which was obviously very defensive, going to Craven Cottage to more of a 4-4-2, a back four of Jordan Gabriel, Keogh, Thornley and Sterling. Uh, it means a change there at the back. The midfield remains the same with Josh Bowler, uh, wide right, who's been the main source of creativity so far this season. He was linked with a move away from Bloomfield Road during the window, but Critchley managed to keep his star man. The changes come up front, though, with uh, Jerry Yates returning. 20 goals in the league last season in League One, firing his side to uh, promotion. He will partner Gary Medine in a front two. And then top scorer for the season so far, uh, Lavery, he drops down to the bench. And you'll notice uh, a former Bristol City man in there, Richard Keogh as well, who uh, Brian knows very well. 
Um, as for Bristol City and, and Nigel Pearson, no need uh, for any changes today, and rightly so. Tim Closer keeps his spot in a back five after an impressive debut. He's flanked by Pring and Thomas Callas. De Silva and O'Dowd will operate again as wing-backs. And then that youthful duo in midfield is trusted once more. Masengo and Scott, they were firing on all cylinders and much talked about among the fans from both sides of the uh, stands at Deepdale last weekend too. Up top, WSM go again. Vyman, Semenyo and Martin, they've got 24 goals and 14 assists between them so far this campaign. And then on the bench, a switch of goalkeeper, Harvey Wiles-Richards, makes an appearance ahead of Dan Bentley. Bell, Benarus and Conway there too. So, so many attacking options at the moment for Nigel Pearson. Right, let's hear from the man that picked today's side. It's Nigel Pearson with Robins TV. Nigel has a blustery Bloomfield Road today. Um, difficult conditions for the group, but another tough away trip. Yeah, I mean, look, <laughs> weather's a part of our, uh, you know, our climate here is a bit uh, changeable, so it's part of life, but uh, no, players are in good, uh, seem in a good mood, so hopefully another good performance. The performance last week against Preston on yeah. the ball and without, very, very solid and move the ball well, you'll be looking for another good performance today. Yeah, we've got to be um, defensively assured too. I think that's important. Um, it's very difficult to dominate um, every game that you play. And, uh, you know, Blackpool are in a decent season. So we've just got to make sure that, firstly, we try and replicate all the good stuff from, from last week. Um, hopefully be a bit more clinical. Um, let's just see how it goes. An unchanged squad today as well, so putting faith back in those guys yeah yeah we yeah we, i don't see much uh, reason to change things around for this game and uh yeah so i'm happy with them over a thousand traveling fans here today they've traveled in their numbers which, which is really great to see that level of support yeah uh, we always appreciate our our fans um when they follow us uh, across the, the length and breadth of the uh, country so it's uh, it's good it's good to get that continued support and obviously we want to make sure that our performance uh, is one that pleases them. One notable name missing from the team sheet today, Dan Bentley not on the bench today, just talk us through that one. Yeah, well he's uh, tested positive for Covid so we just follow the protocols and he'll be back in training on Monday. Nigel Pearson there with George uh, West. That clears that one up on Dan Bentley, tested positive unfortunately for Covid so we wish him uh, well. On reflection of t on today's team, we, we spoke about it. I think Blackpool were in for a, mi a central midfielder during the transfer window, but Scott and Masengo may be an opportunity today, considering they played up against, I think, a, front, uh, a midfield three for, for Preston yeah. to really, again, show what they're all about in the heart of midfield. It's a really important part of the pitch to dominate games. And last week, uh, Masengo and Scott absolutely ran the game with their energy and with their quality on the ball. So. I'm sure now he's the one thing he will be looking for now is consistency. You know, we played at Luton, we should have we won the game at Luton, we were better than Luton. We've gone and done it again against Preston, now can we do it again today? So I'm sure he wants a consistency, so when he turns up the manager, he knows what's going to happen. Because I think we've been a little bit up and down this season and he's looking and thriving to get that consistency in the team where we, he knows what we're going to get. I want to mention Cam Pring as well. <coughs> he seems like the sort of player, just from the outside, that, that Nigel Pearson seems to love. You know, there's no particular, you know, particular thrills about him necessarily. No. He just gets the job done. He's consistently performing and he's strong and robust back there as well. He now feels and looks like he belongs in the championship. I think we've been waiting for that. We've had conversations over the last two or three years with different people that, is he ready, is he ready? You know, I probably thought he was ready two years ago to be involved in our squad. Um, but he's had to be patient. He's come back uh, from Portsmouth last year. Probably would have played under Dean, but got his hamstring injury when we called him back in the January. But Nigel has now given him his opportunities, taken that. And he can fill different positions as well. He can play left of a three, he can play left wing back, he can play left back. So he's been very good. And talking of the youth that's involved in today's squad, somebody that's travelled with the squad but not actually in the match day uh, squad necessarily <coughs> so is Josh Hours and a yeah. brilliant opportunity for him and something that the coaching staff like to do now is bringing these young players along with them. Yeah, definitely. When the uh, Kingy and Matty James got injured and then Tyreek went um, out on loan to Ipswich, then the midfield was an area where there was an opportunity. Josh has been consistently uh, one of our best players in the 23s. He's been out to Bath City and got some men's football. 
So yeah, that was the the obvious choice then to go over the first team and train, and he's getting great exposure, and he's he's loving every minute. Fantastic. Well, we may well see him on the bench uh, very soon. Uh, our strike force, though, has been in scintillating form of late. Eleven goals between them all in January. So let's see the very best of WSM. Scott looks to release Andy Byman. Lovely touch by the Austrian. Can oh. he respond straight away? Cries of a penalty. Here's Chris Martin. Yes, get in. Fantastic. A fantastic strike from Bristol City's number nine. The perfect response. Well played to the referee there. He can have an assist because I was about to say, give us a free kick. Great finish. Lovely pass by Scotty. Andy does well to affect him. From range this time, but Bristol City yeah. following that rebound could break. Semenyo's away on, again. Now, can he shrug off Harrison Reed? He shoots. Oh, hits a yes, post. And in. In there. What a oh. remarkable finish from Antoine Semenyo. He doubles his tally for the afternoon. He silences the home fans. He's come of age here, Antoine Semenyo. What a goal that is. Bristol City really benefiting from the pace that Pring and Callas have either side or closer. Here goes Masengo, carving, Preston open at will. Wow, Semenyo! what a finish. Lashes it home at the near post. What a strike, pure, pure strike. Took, you know, the goalkeeper didn't even know it was past him and Rip took the net out. Brilliant strike. A breathtaking finish from Semenyo. Go on, Anton. Go on, Anton. Antoine uses his pace and acceleration. Can Andy Vyman finish it? Yes! It's Derby Delight again for Andy Vyman. Bristol City have the two goal cushion. Will that seal the points in the Severs side derby? Could this be Bristol City's first double since the early 2000s? A fine finish. Scott utilises the pace of Semenya. On, switches He's switches inside on. the Fulham box now. Twists and turns past Kenny. Yes, shoots a goal. Get in there. And Bristol one. City take the lead inside 10 minutes. The away end in raptures. A thunderbolt finish from Antoine Semenyo. And we are up and running at Craven Cottage. Superb. Absolutely superb. Breathtaking, counter-attacking football from Bristol City. The move was set off in the middle of the park. Trickery from Semenyo and a stunning Thunderbolt finish as well and Bristol City have made quite the start. I think, um, you know, all through the academy. That's a really poor clearance. Is there an opening goal? There is. And it's Andy Vyman hits double figures for the season. A really sloppy clearance from Biakowski. And it's first blood to Bristol City at Ashton Gate. Hughes really has his work cut out with the physical aspect of Semenyo's game. And now there's some real space here for Andy Vyman. Now Chris Martin draws the keeper and he buries it. Fantastic play. Great strike by Martin. Just made, got himself a yard. Lovely pass down the side of him. Got a yard and pings it in the far post. Fantastic goal by Bristol City. Loving those goals. Brian, favourite there for I you? I think the Antoine double at uh, Fulham was outstanding. Two outstanding goals. Pity yeah. was on the wrong end of the result, but he deserved better that day, I think. Hopefully more for Antoine today. Uh, looking ahead to the second half of the show, we'll be hearing from Tommy Conway, and then we won't be too far away from kickoff after this short break.
Welcome back to Robins TV. Bristol City on the road today to Bloomfield uh, Road. Excitement uh, among those travelling Bristol City fans. Hopefully they can get back to winning ways, a much needed win as well. But looking ahead to today's game, a young man who is uh, very highly regarded among the coaching team, not necessarily had many opportunities thus far given the form of Vyman, Martin and Semenyo, is Tommy Conway and this is his journey so far. Tommy, welcome to Robins TV. We're here today to document your journey to the Bristol City first team, but also for you to give us an insight into how a footballer becomes professional, if you like. So for you, how did it start? I mean, you, you grew up in Taunton, so was there a moment when somebody came and watched you play and said, you know, this, this kid here could be quite useful to us? Yeah, so I started playing football, you know, in the usual ages of four or five for my local team, uh, for my dad's team on a Sunday. And... Um, it was a Sunday, normally a tournament in the summer when you're off school. So um, it was up in Bristol, in Brislington. So I went there and obviously the scout from Bristol, because it's quite local for them, they would come across and watch. And um, yeah, Bristol City and Bristol Rovers were there and they both, they scouted me. <laughs> and I had trials at both and then uh, obviously picked uh, Bristol City to sign with when I was seven, yeah. Was that an easy choice? Yeah, it was an easy choice <laughs> when, uh, when you think about it and Bristol City Championship club back then considered to Rovers it was only a, it was a no-brainer. Of course, of course. And how early did the likes of Brian Tinian start having conversations with you and you know starting to pick up lessons from him? I mean, I knew about Brian when I was growing up in the academy. Like you always hear about him, um, but I think when I was an under 16, started to hear a lot more about him. That's when they decide whether you're getting a scholarship mm. or not. Um, and then when you become full-time as a scholar, I think you see him every day. So then he's always there for a chat or he'll pull you for a chat. And yeah, I think as you just get older, go through the age groups, he's more and more involved. So yeah. Yeah, so that's, sort of, you know, 16. When you get to sort of 17, 18, I think you start to, to go out on loan and get your first experiences of, of men's football. How were your loan spells? First at Yate and yeah. then, of course, at Bath City. Yeah, so I was a second-year scholar around Christmas time. Um, just before COVID, I went on loan to Yate. There was four of us who went out. Um, just to get a taste of men's football at that age. Um, uh, done well and that lasted about two or three months. And then obviously COVID hit and we went into lockdown, so that ended. And then when we come back, um, I got offered a pro contract, signed that and went on loan to Bath City in the August, September pre-season. And then played 16 games there and scored 13 goals. And then come back in the January because that their league got postponed because of COVID. And then, um, yeah, I just joined back with the 23s from then on. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, obviously, got the call up to the first team a couple months later after that. That season that you mentioned of, you know, 13 goals and 16 games for Bath, it starts at Bath, it ends at Coventry and Millwall. We'll start with Coventry, where you finally get to pull on that red shirt for your debut at Coventry. When did you find out and who told you? Um, well, the day before, obviously, I found out that I was travelling to Coventry. So, and it was a 20-man squad, so because there was nine subs then, you almost know you're going to be on the bench. So it was all about just if whether I'm going to get onto the pitch and no one said anything to me the day before or nothing and it just come down to the day of the game and I think Pat Mountain just turned around and just told me to get warm and then within about three minutes, four minutes, I was getting called back, get my shirt on and I was on the pitch. So yeah, it happened pretty quick. Yeah, I mean, that's a proud moment. There's an even prouder moment coming because you score your, your first goal. That comes against Millwall at the end of last season. So tell us about that and how that, I guess, gave you a bit of a platform to be a more regular starter this year. Yeah, so then after the after the Coventry game and uh, Nottingham Forest, where I come on as a sub the week after, I uh, got my first start and then obviously started against Millwall as well. And all the boys were saying, oh, you're going to score today, you're going to score today. And you're just like trying to not, not let, that, let that get to your head and... Um, Obviously, the game started and we went 1-0 down and then um, the ball went through and managed to nick it around the goalie and uh, put it in the net and, yeah, it was a great feeling to score for Bristol City. It was a surreal moment mm. because I've been here for so long and to believe I actually scored for the first team wasn't like quite believable, but, um, yeah, once I scored, I was over the moon, but we didn't get the result we wanted on the day, but it was a proud day for me to score for Bristol City, yeah. Absolutely. More to come, hopefully, by the, uh, the end of this season as well. Yes, hopefully. Hopefully, indeed, Tommy Conway there with Dan White earlier on this week. 
Uh, but now it's time to head back to the year 2000, where a certain man alongside me uh, got another assist in a victory over today's opponents. Mickey Bell's fitness was a boost to City, and he was the first to strike for goal in what proved a pretty one-sided game. City dominated from the start, but it wasn't Tony Thorpe's day in front of goal. This one of several chances that went begging. Some slick approach play delighted the travelling fans. Thorpe's cross come shot just eluded Scott Murray at the far post. City were passing the ball with confidence and accuracy, giving a pedestrian home defence problems with virtually every attack. The breakthrough had to come, and it did on 21 minutes. More good interplay saw Paul Holland release Murray, and the Scot finished coolly for the second successive game. One nil to the visitors, and already it could have been two or three. Holland's influence on City's displays is growing, along with Murray's goal tally. Blackpool had rarely threatened, but Billy Mercer had to be alert to turn aside John Hill's powerful drive. The equaliser came out of the blue, literally as far as Mercer was concerned, as he was caught out by the swirling wind and John Murphy made the most of a rare lapse. You can count Mercer's mistakes since he joined City on the fingers of one goalkeeping glove, but that didn't ease the frustration at a level half-time scoreline. It didn't take long for the lead to be regained, Keith Millen's looping header proving an unlikely match winner. City have lost only once in 15 league games since Millen was signed from Watford. Typically reliable at the back, his second goal for the club was an added bonus, appreciated by the fans. Blackpool did their best to respond, and the blustery conditions again caused City problems, leading to a chance for their former winger Junior Bent, on as a substitute. While Mercer gave his defence a gentle reminder that the game wasn't won, former Swindon boss Steve McMahon tried to plot a way back for his struggling team. Still, it was City who looked the more likely scorers. Murray's shot bringing in an orthodox save from Tony Cage and almost an own goal from Clark Carlisle. Another near miss, but that didn't worry City's travelling army as the caretaker management team took their unbeaten run to an impressive six games. Hopefully those travelling fans will have something to cheer about again today. Right, time for you to uh, grab your match day passes. If you are watching overseas today, you can uh, grab those at robins.bcfc.co.uk. But at this point, we say goodbye to those of you that are watching us today on YouTube and Facebook.